annual meeting Sunday, uh, our voting was pretty simple. Uh, especially those of you who voted know what I mean. Um, but nevertheless, it was enough of a distraction in preparation and stuff that I came up here without my sermon notes. Forgot those. But before that, um, I realized that I didn't have my PowerPoint clicker with me. I had to go get that. Uh, and so there were some confusing things going on. Um, but because it's uh, annual uh, meeting Sunday, uh, and because we uh, actually have, you know, a lot of new faces from two years ago, a year ago, um, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of, uh, uh, today especially, um, kind of present what, uh, what I've always referred to as our Kenosha Family Church Manifesto. Uh, kind of a, a brief uh, explanation of uh, kind of who we are, what we're about. Um, and uh, some of you have heard it before. Uh, for some of you, it's been a really long time since you've heard it. Some of you have never heard it. Uh, so that's what I want to do today uh, as we uh, move on into the service. Uh, to begin with, uh, we begin our manifesto, that it, you know, our, our who we are, our what we're about, with the idea of, of our desire. What is it that as, uh, as church family, as people of Kenosha Family Church, what do we want? And uh, the simplest, briefest way that we talk about that is to say that we want to be Christ-like disciples. Uh, we want to be followers of Christ. Uh, that's what a disciple is, a follower, a student kind of a thing. Uh, and, and we want to be Christ-like. Uh, we want to, to be like him, not only what he taught, but what he modeled. Uh, and so our desire is to be Christ-like disciples. Well, that raises the question immediately, well, what is a Christ-like disciple? Uh, I just gave you a very brief explanation, uh, and I'll kind of repeat it. Uh, it is basically people who follow Christ's teaching and example. Uh, so when we think about uh, what we want to be, uh, our, the desire of our hearts is to, uh, is to follow Christ's teaching and follow Christ's example. Uh, you know, primarily, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, we've talked about those for the last couple of weeks, primarily we get uh, Jesus' uh, stories about him, the things that he did, and we get uh, a large amount of his teaching. And so uh, we draw an awful lot of our faith from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and, and that is all about uh, who it is that we want to be. Uh, well, uh, it is fortunate for the sake of uh, simplicity, um, that at some point somebody had come to Jesus and asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And the answer that Jesus gives us is kind of our, our foundation for everything else. So I want us to look at uh, what turns out to be the, the great commandments. Uh, Matthew chapter 22 is where the story takes place in the teaching. Verses uh, 34 to 40. So as the story picks up, uh, some of the Sadducees, and uh, in, you know, if you have forgotten or didn't know, uh, that is kind of the equivalent of uh, our Supreme Court back in Jesus' day. That was like the Israelites' highest uh, legal body. Uh, the Pharisees, they were a, a sect of, of Jews that um, studied the law. They were like the, the lawyers of the day. Um, and they had... Uh, um, the Sadducees had, had come to Jesus with some questions to trip him up, and he kind of beat them. Uh, they kind of lost the debate. And so that's where our story picks up. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. <coughs> One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I love this part. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Uh, so that's the, uh, the great commandments. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, um, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, we even shortened that here at Kenosha Family Church. Uh, and by the way, Christ did model that. Um, the summary is Christ-like disciples love God and others. Uh, that's, you know, you boil that down to a nutshell, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, loving others, loving God. That's what being a disciple is all about. And Jesus said that all the law and the prophets hang on these two things. Uh, and so, you know, you think, well, let's take the Ten Commandments. Uh, Thou shalt not steal. Well, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from him. And so, you know, by loving him, you already keep that commandment. If you love your neighbors as yourself, you're not going to, you know, including your spouse, you're not going to cheat on your spouse. You're not going to commit adultery. Uh, if you love God, uh, you're going to worship Him only. Uh, you know, all of those other laws that we have, all of those other things, uh, hang on these two. And so, since they are so foundational, uh, that's what we kind of use as our summary of uh, what it means to, to be a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, again, our, our desire is to be Christ-like disciples, people who love God, love others. Which brings us to our mission. Uh, any organization, corporation, whatever, uh, they always have a mission statement, or they should, and, uh, and, and we have one. Um, and it comes from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. So let's turn a few pages over from where we were. We've already talked about the great, commit, or the great commandment. Uh, here, here we're going to talk about the great commission. Beginning with verse 16 of Matthew 28. This is right before Jesus is, uh, after the resurrection, he's been with him for like 40 days, he's about to ascend into heaven. One of the last things he did here. Uh, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, here it comes, All authority in heaven and on earth, where else is there? All authority has been given to me. So Jesus is now supreme commander of the universe. He, he's the, the head guy. Therefore, so given all that power and authority, here's his command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So having been given all authority in heaven and on earth, his command wasn't, go out and dig gold and bring it to me and lay it at my feet. You know, that, that wasn't, you know, uh, go start preparing meals for me and serve me every day. That Having been given all authority in the universe, his command was go and make disciples. Teach people to follow my teachings, follow my examples, uh, help them to be like me. That's his command, it's, and that's, that's the commission that we have. So our desire is to, make, is to be Christ-like disciples. Our mission is to make Christ-like disciples. Uh, <clears throat> so that's pretty simple. But you know how, how humans are. Uh, we like to elaborate 
and we like to, uh, to dig in and go deeper. So, having said that our desire and our mission is to be like Christ, or to be Christ-like disciples and make Christ-like disciples, um, we said that, uh, how does that work out? What's that mean when the, where the rubber meets the road? And so we have said uh, that Christ-like disciples express their love to God and others through these five things. Servanthood, sharing the faith, generosity, spiritual friendships, <clears throat> and a deepening relationship with God. So if we're going to love God and love others, that means we ought to be doing these five things. We ought to be involved in these five things. These five things should describe ourselves. So we've already looked at the great commandments. We've looked at the great commission. And I want to suggest one more short passage that when you take them all together, they provide kind of the biblical support for these five things. And so I want to read the, the next one. It comes from Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. So this passage combined with the great commandments that we looked at, the great commission that we looked at, uh, gives us the rest. <clears throat> Subtitled, The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So, so that with the great commandments, love God, love others, the great commission, make disciples of all nations, uh, and this passage uh, feeds into these five things that we believe uh, it kind of explain or elaborate on what it means to love God and to love others. So let's look at the list. Uh, number one was servanthood. By servanthood, uh, we mean that Christ-like disciples follow Jesus' example and look for ways to serve those around them. So at one point, Jesus says, I came to serve. Uh, he didn't come to be served, which is what most leaders were doing those days, but to serve. And uh, when, when he saw people around him that were ill, uh, he, he uh, healed them. Uh, there is, of course, the great story where he's been preaching all day and he's had a big crowd following him around. And uh, it's getting late and he tells his disciples, um, we need to feed these people. Uh, they're hungry and they've been, you know, we need to take care of them. So the people hadn't come to him and said, Lord, feed us. Uh, he he knew that they were hungry. The disciples that actually came to him and said, uh, it's getting late, everyone's hungry, send them away. And Jesus says, no, we need to feed them. Uh, Where are we going to get food for these people? He said, you feed them. And then he, you know, multiplied the, the bread and the fish and was able to feed everybody. Uh, so serving people uh, is one of the things that uh, he did with great regularity. And if we want to be like him, we need to be servants. Um, I think, and I know this is uh, a little paradoxical, because Gandhi was not a Christian. He was of another faith. And yet he made a statement that I believe uh, should be the statement that every Christian should make. Uh, he had arrived at a, at a place where he was expected to speak, and there was a crowd there or whatever, and someone came to him, 
and asked him if he would help. I don't know if they were setting up or what the exact details were. And he said to them, I am willing to do whatever is not beyond my capacity. I am willing to do whatever is not beyond my capacity. He didn't say, well, you know, that, that's kind of beneath me. Get someone else to do that menial chore. Uh, if I can do it, I'm willing to do it. And I think that is what we ought to be like as Christians. Uh, we ought to be willing to serve in any capacity that we can. Um, anytime we can. Uh, so that is the first of our five. Sharing the faith. Christ-like disciples ought to be carrying out the Great Commission. Uh, remember, make disciples of all nations. We do that by sharing God's love with those who have not yet understood or embraced it. Uh, we are surrounded by people who, who haven't come to Christ. We are surrounded by people who haven't uh, converted to being followers of Christ. And the way we help them to make that decision is by sharing God's love with them. We exhibit God's love. We show them God's love. We tell them about God's love. Um, we do that to those who have not yet understood it or those who have kind of understood it but not embraced it for one reason or another. Uh, so that is our task. Uh, we are supposed to share the faith. On a practical level, uh, one of the ways we do that is we invite people to come here with us uh, so that we can hear sermons like this and learn about God's love and that kind of thing. Uh, we invite people to, to Bible studies and Sunday school classes where they learn about God's love. Um, we tell them ourselves about God's love. Uh, we demonstrate God's love by, by loving them. Uh, all of those things uh, to help spread the gospel. Remember, the gospel is the good news. Uh, then there is generosity. Uh, Christ-like disciples understand that all they have is actually God's. And that we are but stewards. So, so God has all this stuff and what we have, what we think is ours, my house, my car, my bank account, that's God's and he's kind of let me take care of it for him. Uh, that means uh, that in gratitude, thankfulness for what he's given me, uh, disciples generously use those resources in God-pleasing, God-honoring ways. That's what it means to be a good caretaker of God's stuff. We use it in God-honoring ways, including, I feel like that fast-talking disclaimer at the end of some commercials, <laughs> including but not limited to money, food, housing, relationships, influence, skills, and time. We are supposed to be stewards of all of those things, and we want to use all of those things in God-honoring ways. And so one of the things that means is that we don't have to give every penny we have to the church. You know, there are some cults that do that. You join a cult, they'll say, give us all your assets. We'll liquidate them and put them in our funds, and then we'll kind of take care of you our way. But that's not what, that's not what Jesus has taught. Uh, so God-honoring ways, God wants us, if you have a, a, a spouse and kids, to take care of them. That means, you know, providing housing and food and, you know, doing those kinds of things. God wants us to be contributors to our society. That means paying taxes. And I know that gets controversial because uh, it is true that when the government says, this is how we're going to spend your taxes, most of us say, well, we agree with this, this, and this, but not that, that, and that. Well, you know, we don't get to choose. Uh, we're going to support our society, uh, so we form a government, the government charges us taxes, 
uh, they, the government whom we elect decides how those taxes are going to be spent. And we're not always going to agree because we don't get to pick every little detail. Um, but that's part of what it means to be generous. Uh, helping people in need. You know, we have our annual alabaster offering. Uh, we have our, uh, you know, our Easter offering we just took. Uh, that's how we're generous with others. And, uh, and we want to be generous with our influence, uh, generous with our skills. Uh, something is broken. Uh, I don't remember the last time Kenosha Family Church uh, paid someone to fix something. When things break, we have guys and sometimes gals that come and fix it. They give their time when you're not watching them uh, to come here and take care of stuff. Uh, make minor changes. I, I guess when we, uh, when we closed the pass window from the kitchen to that back classroom, we hired that done. It was going to take some expertise and a lot. Uh, that might be the last time we hired someone to fix something. Um, and that's being generous with your skills and your time. Uh, the next one, spiritual friendships. And, and I love the wording of this. Christ-like disciples understand, and here it comes, friends of Jesus should be friends with each other. Isn't that awesome? Friends of Jesus ought to be friends with each other. If you love Jesus and I love Jesus, shouldn't we love each other? That's just the way it works. They frequently get together, individually and in groups, for encouragement, support, loving accountability, teamwork and mission, and even fun. <coughs> Why do we have game night? Because we ought to be friends with each other. We ought to have fun together. <coughs> Uh, some of the things that we've done for our missions work. Why do we do those things? Well, because some of those things are easier with teamwork. You know, i got to tell you, I can't afford to pay for someone to move to Zimbabwe and start churches there. In fact, probably Kenosha Family Church, if we pool our money, we can't afford to hire someone and send him to Zimbabwe. But by involving in teamwork, when every other Nazarene church in the world takes an Easter offering and sends the money to our headquarters, our headquarters can say, oh, we have enough to send people to 164 different countries. And so that's currently where we are, 164 versus 165. Uh, that's, that's how many different countries we have sent missionaries to our world areas too. That's part of what it means to have teamwork. Um, and so uh, that's why we get together, that's why we have parties, that's why we have fellowships, that's why we do things. And then uh, the fifth one is a deepening relationship with God. Christ-like disciples practice intimate worship, both private and corporate, that means, you know, you should be worshiping God when you're alone. You worship God as a group. Uh, things like Bible reading and Bible study, as well as using other spiritual resources. You know, those books that Our Lady's Ministries uses from time to time. Um, prayer and obedience to His leading, following Him in faith. Uh, you know, if you're praying about something... And God kind of puts something on your heart that you need to do, a task you need to carry out, a relationship you need to try to mend, whatever it might be. If you don't obey, he's probably not going to teach you much more. You're going to come to him and say, Lord, you know, I'm thinking about this, I need an answer. And he says, what about that person you were supposed to fix up that fight you had? You go fix up that fight you had, 
And then we'll talk about that next step that you're asking about. Uh, I think that's the way he usually works. Now sometimes in his grace, uh, he'll, he'll be merciful and help us with something even though we haven't done everything else perfectly. Um, but we need to do our part if we expect him to keep teaching us. Uh, we believe that when you come to Christ, that is the beginning of a journey. It's not the, well, done that, check, finish there. It's the beginning of a journey. Uh, we should be closer to God today than we were yesterday. We should be more like him today than we were five years ago. We should always be drawing closer to him, becoming more like him, having a deeper and deeper relationship with him. Uh, we often, while it's inaccurate biblically, uh, we often think in terms of like the really elderly, long-time Christians being the saints of the church. We think of people like, uh, you know, who have passed, people like Rosalie's mom, Rose, and... Uh, Angelina's grandmother, uh, er, uh, Irma, and Francis Murfeld. We think of them as the saints of the church. And I think that the, the reality is, every Christian biblically is a saint. Uh, if, you've been, if you've come to Christ, if you can say you're a saint. But the reason we think of them as saints is because they've had longer to draw deeper and deeper and deeper with the Lord. And by the time they're in old age and ready to pass, uh, they have gotten so close, most of us consider them better at it than us. And that's why we think of them as the saints. Uh, but it recognizes that that's what we mean by that deepening relationship. Uh, that should be you someday. Uh, you know, when you've been a, a follower for 30, 40, 50, 70 years, uh, then you'll be more like that uh, because we're always getting deeper and those are the ways that we do it. It's our, it's our Bible reading and Bible study. Um, you know, I was sharing earlier last week how as much as I studied and, and learned this stuff and went over it, uh, I still learn stuff when I read it and, and, and God's still teaching me things. Uh, it never ends. Well, I, I want to close uh, by helping your memories today. I prepared a handout that, uh, that reviews these things and kind of summarizes, gives it to you, uh, that uh, Robin is, and 